Welcome back to Unfiltered Series, Episode 2, where we talk the raw on the real on some pretty taboo subjects and with some very interesting people. Last time we did interview Dina Jones, you may know her as Dina Lynch, and her COVID-19 experience. Whereas this time around, we're going to be speaking with Rob Millsy Mills and his overnight fame experience, the highs and the lows, and what he's doing now. Enjoy! Rob Millsy Mills, welcome to Unfiltered, episode two. Thanks for coming along. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. No worries. I see yourself isolating, so very good. You're very COVID cool. Yeah, I am. Uh, and it's actually getting quite cold in Melbourne at the moment, hence the beanie. But I'll, <laughs> I usually put the heater on at night time, but I think I'm all right for now. But no, actually, it's just mainly because I've got terrible hair. I'm wearing, uh, wearing yeah, this is um, no haircut for three months, maybe more. It's working for you. I think you should roll with it. Yeah, I said to my partner, I've come this far. What would happen if I just kept growing it till the end of the year? She's like, bum. Maybe. I've never I've never grown it long. I've always had to cut it for work or I mean, especially the last sort of three years with neighbours, you have to, you know, keep it the same length because you you don't age or grow. It's just <laughs> you just you're just stuck in time. In Ask Kyle and Susan, they'll be able to give you some tips. I oh, know, no, no. <laughs> over over time, bloody great. Love, <laughs> love uh, Fletch and Jackie. So great. <laughs> you maybe should bring back the eyebrow ring as well. I've got the hole for it still. It's still it's still, it's still there, but no, I, I don't think so. I think that was um, as rebellious as I got um, back then. It was a kind of a the eyebrow ring came up. Um, we just finished the Australian Idol tour, and I was like, oh, I need to do something to signify it and i'm scared of tattoos so i um got that instead got and, that was, and that was in there for i think three years Ugh. okay three years that's pretty solid for an eyebrow ring yeah that's three probably... years to realize that maybe an eyebrow ring wasn't the coolest accessory in the world oh, that was pretty cool <laughs> let's yeah. get cracking on you so Taking it back to 2003, Australian Idol auditions were coming up. Was mm. it a bit of a, I can just, cause you're so, you're such a guy and you're so easy going. Did you enter Australian Idol, you know, really serious, like you wanted to win, this was your, this is your option or your, your route to fame. And you know, this is the be all and end all, or was it a bit, bit of a joke? Um, I wouldn't say it was a joke. I think it was more of a, let's just see what happens. I had a friend of mine who said that the show had been quite successful in the States the year before. I think it was Kelly Clarkson, maybe had won it in 2002. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna be the first time it's gonna be in Australia. So I thought, what have I got to lose? I'm, I'm working in a factory during the day, scanning forms, and I'm singing in, singing in pubs four nights a week in Melbourne. So I've already got a bit of confidence up from singing in pubs for the last three years. Yeah, what's, what's the worst that can happen? So I went along on the Friday night, after my, uh, no, it was a Saturday morning. I went in and they told me to come back tomorrow. They'd already, they'd already had too many. Oh. So that was, about, and that was at 10 AM. So the Saturday night I had two gigs that night on Saturday night. And I thought, Oh, I don't want to miss out. I'll just, I'll go there early in the morning. So my last gig finished at 3 AM. I think I remember going to Macca's or something and getting some food. And I'll, by the time I got there, it was probably 5.30 or 6 AM. So I lined up. And there was already a couple of hundred people there lining up. And Rob Mills. And went, yeah. And I remember looking around the line and going, okay. And I was feeling pretty confident. As I said, I'd been singing on stage for the last three years. I knew that people were coming to see my band play. So I was like, yeah, I can, I can hold a tune. <laughs> but I didn't sing anything that I would normally sing in the pub. I sang something that I thought that they would like. And that was a Westlife song. Yes. So I sang a pop song thinking that'll be, you know, favorable for a pop song, for a pop show. What I thought was going to be a pop idol kind of thing. And it turns uh, out. And that worked. Yeah. That's great. So did your life drastically change? So from that Sunday morning, as you were lining up to go for the audition, fast forward a couple of weeks and you're in the top five. And unfortunately, mm. you're voted out. 
but still made it, Millsy. Sad, sadness, <laughs> deep, deep sadness. No, I'm happy with the way it panned out. <laughs> um, but did your life drastically change? Was it almost like overnight fame, more or less? Yeah, I remember adding up all the minutes that I was actually on television. And if you sang for like a minute or a minute and a half, plus a little bit of chat with Andrew G and James, um, it was probably added up to about 15 minutes. So I was like, well, it's my 15 minutes. Of it Literally, um, that's what it was. And it did change in a way that there was now a, um, after it being the, you know, the most popular show on television, I think maybe something like 3 million people watched the final, which we were all a part of. And um, I didn't really have a great grasp of who I was as a person, but suddenly everyone else had a, had an idea of who I was from seeing me for 15 minutes on television. Mm. So that I found uh, difficult, um, not difficult in the moment because I was uh, very good at being in the moment. Um, but looking back in it in hindsight, that um, maybe playing to the perception of who I was instead of just actually trying to work out who I was. So that's, that's, that was the only thing that was, I think, most difficult. Yeah. And did you, did you find that a lot of your friends kind of changed as well? And they were like, okay, so now Rob's famous. So why didn't we call her? Or it was a bit of, was there any, um, I guess, friction between any of your friends from pre-Idol Rob to post-Idol Rob? Not really. I'd sort of moved away from a lot of my high school friends. Um, I've, I left school end of year 10 to go to another school and then didn't really find a great click in that school either. So I was sort of, no, I wouldn't say I was a loner. I still had friends, but um, no, I don't think I, I don't think I changed at all, but I had already started the sort of the progression of moving away from my high school friends mm. because of, you know, your friends in high school or primary school, they often because of geographical circumstances, not because they are the, the best friends that you could ever right. meet in the world that have the same ideals and um, the same work ethic or same drive or whatever, whatever it is, enjoy the same movies. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think I changed. I've got two older brothers and a great sort of family core that really kept me grounded throughout that time. So no, nothing really changed for me other than um, me just to work out who the hell I was. That was the, that was the hardest thing. Of course. So from, Australian Idol and taking that as it came, obviously, and then from yeah. Miss Vanity and then, and then your album, Up All Night in 2004, like that went really well on the charts, making it to number 21 on the ARIA charts. Yeah, it's pretty good. I did my investigator journalism correctly. Great work. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and then, you know, you had the success with um, Celebrity Apprentice, Dancing with the Stars, obviously Nabs, as we spoke about earlier, Neighbours, and... Broadway and stage. So would you consider yourself primarily an actor or primarily a singer? Or you're a double um, threat? Double threat, good. I love that you didn't throw in dancing because uh, I didn't do well in Dancing with the Stars. I was out second and if anyone saw me in Wicked, I was, when I was dancing through life, I was dancing for my life every, <laughs> every night. A lot of dancers on that stage just judging. Come on, mate, hit that tour, hit the tour, hit the second. <laughs> um, I kind of, I kind of like the idea of, and I, I still, I like being a slashy, uh, you know, um, being able to do a bit of everything. Um, mm. I still really enjoy hosting. I still really enjoy teaching. I still really enjoy um, being on your side of it as well and asking questions. I don't know if you've noticed already. I have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, if I can continue, just keep, uh, keep going down this path of um, being able to, do a bit of everything, um, then that's that's kind of that's kind of good. I don't know. I feel it's like great, isn't it? the more springs to your bow, the better, especially yeah. in Australia. And it gets to mix it up. When you're bored with one thing, you can move on to the next. Correct, and I'm easily bored. So. Okay, noted. Noted. Yeah. <laughs> Not at this though. This is great. This is great. Pressure is on. <laughs> this is great. All right. Um. And when you look back on that overnight fame, or should we say over five week fame? Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> and the, the ups and downs from that and, and I guess facing the challenges of people knowing who you are on the street. Did you still have any pinch me moments that you 
you know, might have taken a day to set in and you're like, oh my goodness, that actually happened. It was a bit of a pinch me moment in hindsight from those days. Um, I don't think I did that enough. And I think every time I've had a chat with uh, kids at schools or um, professional speaking, it, it has been that the importance of taking stock of um, what has just happened, um, whether it's the, the hero's journey that you've been on or whether it's just um, being grateful in the moments. And I think I've learned that later in life and that through, uh, through therapy and a bit of meditation and, uh, and whatnot. But I think at the time I was so good at living in the moment that I forgot to take stock of all the things that was happening mm. or it was being reported in magazines. And I was like, no, that's just, someone's doing it. <laughs> My mum's scrapbooking for me. <laughs> <laughs> but all the magazine stories true. Sure. Pretty much. Like there's no real, I've never had to lie at any interview or had to hide anything away. I think that's why they don't talk about my life in magazines anymore. They're like, oh, it's just boring. Boring. <laughs> it's boring. Yeah. He's just down. He's just too honest. <laughs> too honest. We've got, we've got nothing. We've got no dirt on it. In saying that and how you're saying about your mental health and, and taking in the moment, how is your relationship with your own mental health? And is that something that you had to nurture along the way from having so much spotlight on you? Or is it something that you already had really good grasp of? Uh I think I've always been a pretty empathetic, caring person. Um, I don't know if that's the level of my estrogen in my body. I haven't actually had a test, but I'm pretty, um, I wouldn't say I'm feminine. I think I'm just a- In touch with your emotions. Yeah, I'm more in touch with my emotions than probably your average bloke. Um, and also not afraid to say that I am. That's good. Which is always, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm the anti-toxic masculinity. Um, I can't stand that kind of, blokey alpha male kind of um behavior it doesn't really i find it hard to connect with that person with a, whether it's from a from a female or from a male mm. um but my mental health is pretty darn good i've been seeing a psych on and off for years and years but then i found one up in brisbane who i skype with um who i did a few chats with at the start of covid to just get people to i asked him a few questions about the importance of seeing a psych or um, what they're probably going to expect in isolation over the next few months and just put up a series of little videos. Um, and that was kind of my way of, cause I'm not an expert and I, I find it, I find it weird how people go um, that, that are now mental health experts when they haven't done no psychology degree or which, which I haven't. Um, so I thought who better to talk about this stuff than a proper psychotherapist who deals <laughs> people's problems every day. Yeah. So I think my plan is to get more people to realize that how important it is if your head's a bit hurt to go and get that fixed. If your hamstring's sore, you go see a physio. If your head's not quite right, you just go see a psych uh, or a, or a counselor or whatever form it, it might be. And to break down the stigma of, Oh, I'm not crazy. Oh, only crazy people go see a psych. Like, no, 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 they don't. It's just more to, to get a um, an unbiased opinion as well. I think the thing I love most about it is you can spend an hour, hour and a half with your psych and offload all your uh, woes, problems, issues, uh, glories, like all, all the things that are even going well in your life and, and victories. And then at the end of it, they just give you some really good perspective. With your own personal journey back in the day, was there a point in the early days, again, post idol, where you did really struggle with your mental health and you had a bit of a, a wake up call and like, okay, I need to really take a hold of this and grasp my own headspace? Yeah, I, I got some pretty bad anxiety during idol. Um, I remember the first time I felt it, we had a signing at a, like a, a shopping center and there was just a lot of people. And I think it's because I'm quite extroverted. I'd probably be at like, 80% extrovert, 20% introvert at the shopping center. Like there was so much energy coming like and screaming and, Hey, how you going? Hey, how you going? Hey, how you going? Hey, how you going? Like signing stuff. And just, I got really overwhelmed. I had to take a break. Um, it's happened a few times uh, during gigs where I was just so hyped up. Um, but then after 
I think it was up on the Gold Coast for the V8 Supercars or Indy or something. And I was out afterwards and had a few drinks during the day. But then I just got mobbed on the streets, like uh, not tackled, but like was getting headlocks and like in a friendly kind of jovial way. But it was so much and people were wanting to take photos and grabbing me and moving like, oh, you know, just wanted a piece of me. I'm so glad that doesn't exist uh, now. I'm so glad, yeah, that doesn't happen anymore. But <laughs> shout out to COVID. Good, but, well, it was just yeah, exactly because of one point five. Oh, one point five minutes. One point. <laughs> um, that I got so wound up and so anxious. I just jumped into a car that I didn't know. I just ju- jumped into someone's car and I said, "Can you just drive me to um, to my hotel?" So I, they dropped me off, and my mate said, "Are you alright?" I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine." I'm just like put on a brave face and I went upstairs to my hotel room and um, the balcony door was open. It was like the 35th floor or something. And I, I looked at it and I went, you could just, you could go if you want, if you just wanted to, if you, you can. And I went, nah, I ran to the door and I slammed it. And it was was one of those moments of, uh, it was the first time I'd ever thought you could just take your own life. Like what would it, what would it matter? What would it matter if you, or was it something that you stood there and you really, really was, actually processed? It was like the world slowed down to like Michael Bay slow down kind of. Yeah. And, but it probably was, it was probably a second. It was pretty and, terrifying though. Yeah. Was, would that be the only time do you think you would have actually faced that thought or has there been other times from there? No, that was, that was probably it. I think in it, in that moment, I realized that I had more to do, that I, I would hurt too many people, that um, that I wanted to do more with my life. Yeah. And, would you and say every that time that sort of, I don't think I've, I've ever been that scared. Um, and that's weird because I was just scared of people and yeah. the anxiety was so much. I think you hit the nail on the head, like the word overwhelming can be so understated and it can actually mean so much and affect you so much. But people yeah. don't realise. Yeah, I just, but I, I did a meditation this morning, actually just before we did this. And it's amazing that the feeling of being overwhelmed or anxious is just a thought. Mm. And it's just in your consciousness and you can very quickly just think of something else like think of a happy thought or think of something that makes you grateful for being here or whether it's your kids or whether it's your the love of your partner or whatever that is or a friendship or and how quickly that can just can just turn and we have that power it's all just in our consciousness a little bit um i've read a little bit about it and it's retraining your brain because obviously going to those thoughts is a little bit easier unfortunately (laughs) in your brain and doing the opposite so if what, the more you do the opposite it's like kicking a soccer ball the more you do the opposite the easier it is yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so from that moment forward is that when you really took grasp of your mental health like okay this is something i need to work on and really hone in on or was that absolutely. a real natural journey <laughs> that, that was i was still 20 21 when that was all happening that was yeah, straight after that, yeah and um, then i just i partied for years and years and I have a, like a real black spot in my life of, I don't remember really what happened <laughs> during that time at all. Not that I was um, going, getting blackout drunk every weekend, but I was, it just all blurred. Yeah. It probably wasn't until years later that I, I was like, I need a break. I just need to work out who I am, what I, what I'm doing. And um, it's a really long process. Um, but also I think it helped getting into acting and learning more about scripts and breaking down characters and then going, Oh, I felt that way. Mm. Oh, what would it be if I felt like that? So in terms of your mental health Mm. and going on that track, is that why I wanted to go towards more of a plant based diet? Is it health reasoning? Yeah. I think just in the last few years, my partner and I, we do a bit of Marley spoon and we always have request for a couple of them to be vegetarian. So just to, because it makes you feel better. Like I've got a few vegan mates. I, I don't want to go full vegan, um, but I'll go vego a few times a week. And when Heinz approached me, I was like, yeah, absolutely. And these are great because I went for a run yesterday. I came home and was like, what am I going to have? Bloody have a soup. Awesome. Great, well, um, also, coming, 
also coming into winter, it's better for, look, it's, there is scientific evidence to show that it's better for the environment if you eat more. Um, it's better for climate change if you eat more vegetables than you eat more meat. So, yeah. And I, I think there's a great term, a flexitarian. I kind of like that one. That's a good one. Yeah, Have yeah. So any, um, any kitchen tricks of the trade you can share with us? Uh, with these soups, you just pour them out, put them in the microwave, which is bloody great. <laughs> so that's a kitchen trick. Have you nailed? Have you nailed the microwave timing though? Every microwave's different. Oh yeah, I've nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. It's just a couple of couple of clicks. Um, always good with a bit of bread as well, or oh, a bit of toast. Um, but yeah, I think as far as um, the vegetarian sort of stuff goes, or like plant based proteins, I've I've been having plant based protein for ages. Like I don't like the whey protein. So if I have a workout. I'll have like a, a pea protein. So it wasn't, it wasn't really anything new to me, but I think for a lot of people, they're like, is this like the fake mushrooms? Is this like the, the fake chicken stuff? No, no, this is just getting your protein through like lentils and chickpea, chickpeas and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll run through a few quick questions just to, to finish this up. Yep. Um, who have you been most starstruck from or with? John Farnham, always. Okay, yep. Um, who would you be most, most starstruck with who you haven't met yet? Um, probably Jody Coma from Killing Eve. Oh, yes. Good choice. Yeah, she's amazing. She's, amazing. she's she just incredible. Go to karaoke song. Um, I have a rule. If you're a singer, you can't sing something that you've already sung before. Good rule. I'll have to take yeah. note, obviously, with my singing career. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any exclusives you can share with us? Um, any singles coming out or any sneaky projects underway? Uh, working, on a, on? working on a few, working on a few little projects at the moment. Uh, one is a one man show and we've got a few ideas for a few podcasts. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm in a creative, creative phase. Just got to work harder. Do better. Work harder. Just got to do better. Just got to do better. Yeah, that's right. Um, if you had to choose a last meal, what would your meal be? Uh, chicken schnitzel and chips and salad. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what's been the best memory from your career so far? Can be on stage or behind closed doors? Best memory is finding out that thing that I wanted to do and that was Wicked and then doing was the wicked, wicked? <laughs> wicked, Wicked was Wicked. Yeah, doing the training, learning how to act, learning how to sing and dance and then getting the role after four auditions and then being a part of probably one of the most wonderful stories um, to ever hit the stage. Yeah, Without Wicked, there's no Frozen. Without Frozen, there is girls and boys growing up think that they need a prince to save the day. I know, they need to let it go. And they let it go, guys. <laughs> What's been your favorite character to play? Uh, probably Jamie in the last five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How was it also, on? Oh, What's that? What about Greece? Being Danny would have been pretty cool. No, nah, he's a bit of a douchebag, Danny Zuko. Take that back. <laughs> <laughs> he's charming, but also when she has to change for him, that's not the, that's not the kind of um, story I want to represent. Perfect. Good answer, Millsy. There's that estrogen you're talking about coming through. Nah, it's just, um, just the norm. I'm all about equality. Love that. Um, and if you could do a duet with anyone, who would it be? Ooh, uh, uh, Casey Donovan. She's the best. I reckon we could make that work. I'm working on it at the moment. Oh, oh there's our exclusive. I'm uh, putting that to, I'm actually gonna, <laughs> I'm actually gonna record that this week. There's our exclusive, fantastic. A duet with Casey Donovan. Love that. Now I have to do it. Now I actually have to do it. You've got to be a cannibal. It'll just be a cover. Oh, okay. You make that sound so, like, blase. Yeah. Just a cover, no biggie, you know? It's not yeah. a daily office. No biggie. <laughs> um, if you could have an other, a different nickname other than Millsy, what would it be? Uh, I already have a different nickname. Um, Surely, Millsy, come on. This is all right. I think it's just, it's just the Australian way. You put a Y or an O at the end of your name, and that's... I get Millzo, I get Millsy. Okay. Yep, I get okay. the Mills. Yep, love that. And for the last 30 seconds, do you feel like you've made it? Do I feel like I've made it? 
You know, when people uh, say, um, I just want to make it, I want to make it in the big scene. Do you feel like you've made it? Do you know what? I just feel like I'm happy to have a job in entertainment and I've maintained a career in entertainment over the last, well, what's that? 16 years since Idol. So I'm feeling right. pretty chuffed to still be employable. All right. Thanks, Millsy. Have a really good week and um, we'll flick you all the details from the, from the interview and we'll mash up the, the content in the next week or so. Great. Thanks so much. Cool. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Chat to you soon. Bye. Bye. Now to get us started, I thought it'd be rude not to. I think we should do a vocal warm up. As you're the professional, I will let you. Yes. One. Okay. I could, I could whip out my primary school grade four choir warm up, but yep. I've got a professional in the house. It's all yours. Okay. Um, a really good one just to start this morning time is just to warm up the vocal cords with a bit of a. I don't know if I can do it. I'm gonna start smiling. <laughs> I can't do it. Is there another one? Oh, yeah. right. Try again. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's okay. probably, a bit, probably a bit too forceful, but you might I just relax on it. <laughs> Is this why Brand I'm not successful in my singing career?